We now go into our keynote conversation on green investment. That will be followed by a second set of parallel sessions. And I'm going to remind you of this at the end of this session, but just so you know now, when you go off to those parallel sessions, um, you don't need to stop for coffee because you're going to get a coffee break afterwards. So if you'll go straight into those parallel sessions, that would be much appreciated. Thank you very much. So our first session this afternoon is a keynote conversation on green investment. And it is now my pleasure, without further ado, to hand over to the session moderator, who is Zyman Zadek. He is co-director of UNEP's inquiry into the design of a sustainable financial system. And he is also visiting professor at Singapore Management University and was formerly chief executive of the international think tank Accountability, which he founded. So, Zyman Zadek, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thanks, and I'm going to straight away ask my two uh, 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 conversationalists to, to join the session. So, Ambassador Kamau, if you would join us, and Christian, uh, why don't you uh, come and take a seat? I'm going to sit here, so why don't you, yeah, sure, why don't you sit in the middle? So, uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Welcome back to the, what's known as in English as the graveyard slot, yeah, so you, you've eaten you know, the food has gone to your stomach, the blood is slowing down, you know, you're thinking about anything apart from what's happening on the stage. And, and it's my job to try and get you to concentrate just a little bit, uh, if only for politeness. So uh, actually the session we're gonna have, I think is gonna be fantastic. We're talking obviously about, whether you call it sustainable finance, green finance, green investment, the language uh, is uh, for you, and we have two uh, uh, conversationalists, if you like, uh, that we're going to uh, get a few reflections from and then really get you a little bit more involved uh, in uh, this session, even though we're operating at a plenary level. The, the, the subject, if I can just spend uh, a couple of minutes, uh, if you like, framing it, uh, is sustainable finance uh, and that's already come up in every session, uh, certainly I've been in this morning. Uh, I'm sure I don't have to tell anyone in the room the numbers. Uh, if Sean Kidney was here, he'd be screaming at you, it's not billions, it's trillions, please don't forget. Um, he'd be telling you that it's all incredibly easy if only you understood, um, and if we could get the political architecture more or less in the right place. What are we talking about? We're talking more or less in the 80 to 90 trillion US dollars by 2030, depending on which set of data you look at. Those numbers are heavily skewed towards infrastructure, particularly in developing countries. Uh, we know that you know, across the world, uh, public finance is scarce, and almost certainly 70 or 80% of that money will have to come from the global financial markets. Uh, global financial markets comprise more or less 300 trillion US dollars, give or take a few trillion, you know, more or less split up, you know, about 100x within the banks, um, you know, another 100 trillion or so in so-called fixed income, bond markets, and then a whole bunch in equities and other assets. Uh, that's the kind of the vast scenario, obviously, in most developing countries and many developed countries, uh, financial systems are dominated by banks. Banks don't like lending long-term. That's not what they're designed for. They're designed for shorter term in the main. And so immediately one has the challenge if one thinks long-term investment is part of what we need to finance the SDGs and to address the Paris commitments you know, immediately we have the beginnings of an understanding that the way in which financial and capital markets work, their inner architecture, not just what one good or one bad bank or financial institution does, but the rules governing the way in which financial markets work are not fit for purpose. They're not suited to the financing agenda that we have if we believe that the purpose of the global financial system, um, amongst other things, is to satisfy the financing needs uh, of the real economy over long periods of time, which means 
taking broader environmental, social, and economic issues into account. So the topic today may touch on what public finance is about, it may touch on the role of development banks, but the principal topic is what on earth do we do with this financial system that even on a good day was designed for a different era? And certainly for anyone who's lived through 2008 and looking around at the age profile, I guess that's probably most of us, we're completely aware that there are many problems with the way in which financial and capital markets work, but even in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, there was very little said as the policy and regulatory agenda emerged to fix the system as to where sustainable development really sat in that conversation. So that's, if you like, the frame uh, for the conversation. We have two absolutely fantastic conversationalists. To my left, we have uh, Ambassador Kamal, uh, Special Envoy for the SDGs and Climate Change for the UN President of the General Assembly, as well as a number of other hats that I hope we're going to draw out uh, over the course of the discussion. To my far left, we have Christian Thiemann, uh, Head of Regulation, Sustainability in AXA, uh, obviously one of the large asset managers and insurance companies in Europe and indeed internationally, but also with a number of other hats on, uh, including the co-chair of the UNEP Finance Initiative, and I hope we're going to really get some insight from his experiences as well. Uh, I'm going to ask these gentlemen uh, a couple of questions, get us kicked off, and then very quickly open us up um, to comments or observations or assertions from folks uh, in the audience. So, Ambassador Kamau, I'm going to start with, with you, if I may, your special envoy to the President of the General Assembly. Um, you have a particular interest in finance. Most people working in finance would think, why would the UN have any role in the financial markets agenda at all. And so it would be great to hear from you a little bit about what the PGA's thinking is and what the actions are that are being taken in sort of bringing the UN into interaction with the way in which financial and capital markets are developing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. It's very, very good to be here. Um, let me just begin by thanking um, those who've convened us. Um, uh, the government of Germany and, and uh, Paige and, and everyone else who's been involved in this. It's, it's, a, it's a great honor. It's good to be here. Um, it, you already began by mentioning the fact that a lot has changed over the last five years. Uh, uh, many of you will be aware, and I heard some people speaking a little earlier here uh, at the podium about the kind of activities that the United Nations organizations have been involved in in supporting development in the world over the last uh, 20, 30, 70 odd years. Um, most of that has revolved around goals that were built around overseas development uh, support um, and, and the whole overseas development structure. Uh, we had UNICEF mentioned a little earlier. Um, really work that was really focused on very specific basic services and helping government overcome that challenge. But you know, by the end of the 20th century, we, we all recognized that that model was simply not delivering the goods of changing the world and bringing us up to, the speed, to speed on fighting poverty and bringing health to people on dealing with the challenges of food and food security, peace, and so on and so forth. So here we are uh, at a point at which in uh, 2010, we were beginning to really focus on this idea and uh, Nikhil Seth was here a little earlier and we worked together with him and his team at DESA. Uh, and the world was beginning to really focus on this idea of how are we going to transition from an MDG type framework, that is the Millennium Development Goals type framework, to the challenge that we were facing which had to do with sustainability and the sustainable development world in which uh, challenges that we were facing at the, at the close of the last century. Now, when we did come up with the Sustainable Development Goals, and again, I have to thank very many people, some of whom are in this room for the incredible effort and time that they put into that um, work, it became self-evidently clear that we were not going to finance Sustainable Development Goals with ODA. I mean, not only was this, uh, were these kinds of money minuscule, 
uh, in the face of the challenge of the Sustainable Development Goals. But we recognized immediately that we're going to need a broader range of partners. And again, this was spoken to earlier this morning. But those broader partners were going to bring in not just skills and expertise and technologies, but they were going to have to bring in huge amounts of resources if we were to attain the Sustainable Development Goals. And so, even though the United Nations was not set up to deal with the management or the organization and or the mobilization of trillions of dollars for development, it is having to make the step change in how it operates to begin to figure out how it's going to bring the world together to finance the sustainable development goals. And this is where, of course, you, Simon, and the UNEP inquiry and others have been so instrumental. Because we were pretty clueless, I can tell you. We knew the magnitude of the challenge. We knew we were moving from billions to trillions. But the thought that we were going to have to raise somewhere in the tune of $7 trillion a year together with the entire partnership to leverage the change in the way in which the world did development so that we could build in sustainability into the world's development process. For us to believe that we could do that, we needed the kind of work that you have been doing, UNEP Inquiry has been doing, to give us the confidence and to show us the path from billions to trillions. Secondly, it became self-evidently clear that countries, developing countries, were going to have to play a very different role in financing green investment and sustainable uh, financing for sustainable development. Now, until I would say the end of the last century, a lot of the approach that the United Nations took towards development and towards development programming was about bringing resources to developing countries and then asking them to be accountable in reporting and very rarely maybe UNDP on one or one or two other entities, actually leveraged resources in the countries to change the way in which development was happening in the, various, in the various countries. But the SDGs have changed that completely. Domestic resource mobilization is a core part, if not the largest part, of the development investment that's taking place in the world to attain sustainable development. So no longer are we talking about a world that is focused on a UN paradigm that's built around ODA. We are seeing a world where the sustainable development will be at core financed by domestic resources and at core we'll be looking at ODA still as a very important part of the, of the deal but as a leverage, a leveraging tool for the delivery of financing and sustainable development. So for us at the United Nations, we have become centrally um, involved uh, in ways in which were unimaginable 15 or 20 years ago. And with that, we brought in, the, uh, of course, the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, who are, who are front and center on this process, uh, private institutions, uh, philanthropy organizations, and so on and so forth. Ambassador, thank you. Um, I'm going to come back to the UN, I hope, in discussions. Christian, I, I wanted to turn to you. I, I was sort of wondering, as the ambassador was describing the sort of evolution of the UN in its thinking around finance, kind of what that looks like in the market. Yeah, I'm going to come back later and ask you questions about your policy and regulatory work uh, in other contexts, but, I, but I'd love to get your equivalent not only of what's going on today, but, but why the change and how much change? M many thanks, Simon, and uh, many thanks for the invitation. It's great to be a day out of Paris and back in the town where I was born in, so very happy to be here. Uh, the subject is fascinating. There's a lot happening in the market, and I would say one of the main triggering factors was, of course, the genius in the Paris Agreement to put this innocent line on Article 2 at the end said it needs a reorientation of capital flows. So people have understood, 
And this has means that the climate debate has traveled a long way. If you remember Kyoto and Copenhagen, finance was nowhere in focus. It was an issue of the scientists, of the ecologists, of the industrialists. Now it's an issue for finance. And this has changed very significantly. So on the flip side, if today you go through the financial markets, the actors, you see more and more people looking into green finance. You see, of course, bonds being issued and being bought very heavily, often oversubscribed. And you see more and more actors that are going through and sort of look at their portfolios very carefully under the emissions, under environmental, social and governance criteria. So a real thought process has been set in motion. So finance is changing. And um, I would say that it is, if you like to be optimist, a niche that is flourishing. If you like to be a bit more conservative, you say it's flourishing, but it's still a niche. So that's where we are at the moment. Everybody knows about green finance. Everybody takes it seriously. People are moving towards that. But it is still, of course, a relatively limited sector in financial markets. And the other thing that is interesting to know, it is a sector where almost there's more demand than supply. So many pension funds, insurance companies would like to invest in green infrastructure. But we do not yet see many projects out there. So AXA's balance sheet, 2% are infrastructure. That's not a lot. Allianz, same area of magnitude. So there's a big demand. They would go, like to go to, to 5%, so double their investment. And these are very, very big numbers, obviously. But it's not easy to find the right projects out there. So at the moment, we have a situation, therefore, to summarize where the financial market is moving. People are aware. It's still a small segment, but flourishing. And the main constraints are almost more on the supply side than on the demand side. Christian, can I, can I just test out um, uh, uh, a thought? So, so it is very often the case that when one talks to financial market actors, not including you, um, they go... That's a compliment. <laughs> they go, the, the problem is the pipeline. <laughs> There's a bunch of rubbish out there, and governments haven't sorted it out, and the investment enabling environment is all wrong, and the political risk is too high, and foreign exchange rates of, you know, exchanges from developing countries go all over the shop. In other words... The problem's out there, a lot of the financial market still says. And once they have sorted it out, meaning not finance people, then we will do what we do best, which is financing profitable, you know, risk-adjusted returns and so on. Uh, so obviously I'm slightly exaggerating, but not too much. I hear that every day in my work. And I'd like to get your take of... I don't know, what's, what's the balance sheet between stuff that's got to be fixed in the financial system as opposed to real pipeline problems? I would say, Sam, the fact that you hear it every day and that the fact that you hear it from finance people doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. So... <laughs> Touché. <laughs> um, I must say that we and many others are out there looking for projects. And we just have three conditions, if you like. One, we would like to have projects that are viable. Because if you invest money for the long term, you will not survive an unviable project. It will die in the next political cycle. Second, one needs some sort of cash flow. So, yes, we talk badly about money, but insurers have liabilities. They need to serve as policyholders, so there needs to be some stability of return. And the third condition is regulatory stability. If you put your money for 20 years illiquid in a long-term investment, be it toll roads, windmills, wind farms, solar farms, you want to be sure that halfway through the regulatory, regulatory situation doesn't completely change. And I must say, these concerns to me look quite legitimate. And the proof is that when com projects come on stream that fulfill these conditions, there's a lot of demand. Some of our people say the demand is so high that the return is now squeezed. The return on government bonds being zero, the return on infrastructure is now around 4%, 5%, and that's not, not a loss for the risk. Does that mean there's nothing to do in finance? No. I think there's a lot to do in finance, and this has to do, and maybe we come to that in the conversation, in order to help investors fix more capital on the long term. And this means to overcome short-termism in finance. 
We cannot ask investors to do both, to be perfectly engaged on the long term and be perfectly on the daily fluctuations and the daily tests in the market and the quarterly reporting and so on. I think we have to decide if we want to orient the system towards the long term, we have to look at areas which are too short-termist and where we have to protect investors against swings in financial markets. And I'll definitely come back to that in my second round, if I may, because I think uh, that touches on an area that uh, is somewhat of a mystery to most yes. normal human beings, if I can put it that way. Ambassador Kamal, let me ca come back to yourself. Maybe I'd like you to take off your special envoy hat for a second and kind of put on your um, ambassador of Kenya hat uh, and, and speak a little bit to what you see as happening specifically in Kenya as an example? Well, first of all, before I do that, I want to pick up on something that Christian said because, again, it's, it's one of the challenges that we are facing at the UN. Um, you see, uh, we at the United Nations also see ourselves as member states representing all your countries as an organization that has to create the uh, normative global infrastructure for precisely the things that he's speaking about, to enable the policy frameworks, to enable the regulatory frameworks that can give people comfort to make the right kind of investments over longer periods of time. And these are issues that are discussed at the United Nations and that we try to roll out uh, resolutions and, and, and policy frameworks or normative uh, arrangements that allow for this to actually transpire. Uh, so th there is a connection uh, between, even though it, it sometimes can be seen as very tenuous, but through governments, there is a connection from how we work on these arrangements to ensure that we create the enabling environment for what Christian was speaking about. Because policy, regulation, uh, financing, and budgetary allocations these three things are clearly interconnected and we need to be able to provide the support for that. Now, when it comes to Kenya, and, uh, and, uh, I mean, we are a, a, a developing country, as, as everyone here knows, um, but we have seen uh, how uh, taking the approach of sustainability, looking at issues from a sustainable development perspective has really helped us overcome some of the constraints that we had in the way in which we approached the development challenge that we faced. And things, uh, as, as, as luck would have it, present themselves in very special ways. So for example, uh, one of the biggest challenges to development in our part of the world has been just financial inclusion. Ensuring that everybody was able to access a bank, to have a bank account, uh, to utilize, uh, to have access to money, uh, to transfer money between communities because we simply didn't have the infrastructure. Well, lo and behold, here comes mobile uh, telephony and the technology that revolves around that, and you leapfrog all these uh, 20th century requirements for creating a financial inclusion infrastructure just by having a mobile phone capacity that actually allows everyone to access resources and to share monies within the, uh, through a, a mobile phone. But in and of itself, while that was the opening, that opened up a range of opportunities so that now the same technology is being used to give access to people to energy and light in communities. You had Winnie speaking about solar, uh, the connection between uh, having uh, people able to finance uh, energy at the household level, so you, you don't need to be on the main grid, and that you can make your payments through uh, a phone, and you can do that on a daily or weekly basis, means that the very poor are brought into the mainstream of access to energy very, very easily. It's one simple example, but that phone has become an incredibly powerful tool for in access to energy, for access to market, for managing uh, pricing structures between producers and, uh, and the markets, especially for rural folk who do not want to uh, take their crop off the land when they don't know what the price is in the market that day. They used to do it blindly. Now you just make a call and you get all the prices 
uh, coming through, what's being sold in the various uh, towns and cities around you, and you know exactly where you need to take your potatoes or your cabbages that day so that they don't, because they, they, they can't last. This, this technology has become incredibly powerful, but it is a tool that has allowed people to make investments that have helped green the economy, create, fight poverty, uh, create access to better health, to better education, and at the same time, it's sustainable. Christian, bear with me for a second. I just want to kind of just draw in our, our distinguished guests here and, and just ask if there are any, it doesn't have to be questions to these two gentlemen, but just sort of comments on the topic that people would like to offer up. Uh, we have a roving mic, I am told, which uh, isn't roving, so you're going to get mine. Or do we have a, Yes, we do have one. It's just <coughs> coming. Yes, it's coming. There's an extra mic. Hold on a second. I'm going to solve this problem more quickly. <laughs> just give your name. Timmerman, I'm a journalist. Um, my question is about green bonds and the problem of the supply not being as lively as the demand at this point, uh, particularly because there's regulatory risk. We're not sure if in 15 years' time the feed-in tariffs in Spain or something are going to be what they need to be to make the investments make sense. My question to you is, is there a, maybe a, a solution to this by putting as an intermediary between the you know, companies like yours that are insurers are looking, institutional investors looking to invest a lot of money, and the infrastructure uh, markets, the projects, something like um, a European Sustainable Infrastructure Fund mm. that would issue green bonds that would be sovereign-backed mm. so that you can be sure you're not going to lose. Mm. Right? And if you're sure you're not going to lose, you're, going to be, you're not going to get a high interest rate because it's sovereign-backed. But it aligns, does it not align then the interests of the countries participating and making sure that the regulatory environment remains stable and makes these projects profitable that it then funds through competitive bid markets because otherwise they're going to wind up paying for it? Okay, so in intermediate, we'll come back uh, in a second to the specifics. Other, uh, other questions? Yeah, that gentleman there, please. If you just give your name and keep your remark, uh, Kurt. Um, yeah, it's actually a question. My name's Ellie DeFriend, um, and I'm not a specialist on green finance, so this might sound like a stupid question. If we're all heading for SDGs, and in order for that to happen, we need to invest long term. And the finance actors are having a challenge managing the long term and the short term. Can't we just all agree to forget quarterly reporting and interday fluctuations? Huh. Pullman solution. Okay. All right. So, you know, can we, can we do something? On, on the corporate reporting side to kind of slow you guys in financial markets down. There are, there are two questions lurking over there. Let's take the gentleman at the front and then the lady about 10 rows back. Ah, hello, my name is Hyun Kyu Kim and I've really um, enjoyed this meeting because the, of the SDGs and uh, Mr. Timon's uh, TCFD. These are two examples of voluntary frameworks where companies and organizations decide to bound themselves voluntarily for the greater good. But uh, all morning we've been hearing about regulations and things that needs to be forced and mandatory. Could you enlighten us on these differences between mandatory uh, regulations and these voluntary uh, regulations that actually seem to be more effective in some cases? Great, okay, and we'll come back to the FSB piece. So there's a lot a of times. I know, I know, we are. I just want to pick up uh, comments that a few people have, yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. Um, uh, my question was uh, with regard to, sorry, my name is Cecilia Gidaiga. Uh, my question was with regard to uh, solutions, long-term solutions, uh, with respect to what is achievable now based on commitments um, that uh, people uh, would be willing to, to put on the table uh, in terms of uh, bridging the gap between the rich and the poor or among nations so that we can at least try to check what we have spoken about earlier, greed and uh, the, the, the need to uh, hold and to keep uh, and to yeah, keep investments uh, which are not socially uh, assisting us at the moment. 
Right, so how does one deal with the greed bit that, uh, that Jeff Sachs talked about? Perhaps, Christian, I'm gonna start with you, if yes. I may. Um, you, you don't actually have to answer every question, but certainly I'd love you to touch on uh, your work at the FSB, just yes. to kind of bring out a couple of the answers that are needed. Very happy to do so, and thank you for your comments. These are really, really great comments. On your question, an intermediary, there is one in Europe, and it's called the European, um, the EIB. Um, so there is intermediate, does invest, and issues debt. The difficulty is twofold. One, it becomes like another government bond, and we have a lot of government bonds, and we would love to diversify. So we are flooded with government bonds. There's a lot of government debt out there. And again, it's exactly to go out and diversify. The second is we must not forget equity capital. We cannot run the world on debt. So at some point, every project must have some equity to start with. You cannot run a project in 100% debt. So it would be possible to get also equity investors in infrastructure. And they're ready to take the risk and get remunerated for the risk. Um, the main question is really exactly not to crowd out public money. So I would say intermediary is possible, but should not do everything. To your question on corporate reporting, it's a wonderful suggestion. The Commission is moving in this direction. We have indeed to get the companies off the hook. Um, I uh, recently met a CEO who said it very, very illustratively. He says, I have two speeches in my suit. Here, probably next to the wallet, I have the speech for the financial analysts that come to see me. And all the thing they want to know is about the next quarter. About the returns, the return on capital, the dividend, the cost-cutting exercise. It is absolutely scrutinizing. And that's the disciplinary role of financial markets and so on. And he says, in my right pocket, I have the speech for Davos. And the speech for Davos is about the climate, the future, the education, and the planet. And he says, I'm getting crazy that these two speeches are so disconnected. So I believe what we need to achieve is reconnect these two speeches and allow corporations to have one. It is, if I can say it politically incorrectly, to overcome schizophrenia in markets. We would love the long term, but we also want the short term. And I give you one concrete example to all of you. You are all interested in green finance. So in the afternoon, you go out to your banker, your asset manager, your insurer, and you make sure that they do invest in green bonds and infrastructure, and it's wonderful. The evening, you come home, you switch off the television, and you look at the evening news. And what do you see as the benchmark? You see the standard benchmark in Germany, the DAX, in France, the CAC 40, the FTSE in England, the Dow Jones. Now, whereas in the afternoon, you worried about two degrees and said, I want something that is in line with two degrees, these benchmarks are not two degrees. They are four to six degrees. So this is where the tension is. We are still, that's why I'm saying we are half through. Yes, we are all more interested. There's more coming along. But we are still assessing financial markets with the wrong glasses. We are putting them still through indices and benchmarks that are not two degree, but six degree. And this is one of the big problems we need to address. So I'd just like you, to, if you would, just to give like, I know it doesn't do it justice, but kind of 90 seconds on the FSB related question, since it's something you've been very involved in, not just the mandatory versus uh, voluntary, yeah. just kind of how much difference can climate related disclosure really make? So uh, just to put everybody in the picture, a year or two ago, the central bankers woke up and said, maybe there are risks in the financial system we have overlooked, stranded assets. So maybe we need to know more about climate-related risks. And they have asked a group of 30 representatives from the corporate sector all over the world to provide information, to provide suggestions how firms can inform about climate-related risks. You know that today you invest in a company and you don't know is that company aligned with two degrees or not? Is that company having an investment plan that is towards decarbonized or not? Is it investing in new technologies or not? So what this TFC, TFCD has, TCFD has done, we have worked for one year and provided a voluntary, globally consistent disclosure framework around four very simple questions. So we suggest that all major companies of this world put climate-related risks into their financial reporting. Today you find it in the CEO speeches and a corporate responsibility report, but we would like to mainstream it. 
mainstreaming in the financial filings. And the four questions are, please tell us, company, how one, you're organized around climate risks. What's the role of the board? What's the role of management? And so on. That's the governance part. Second question, what's your strategy on this and how is the strategy aligned or not with a two-degree scenario? And we're asking them, provide us the film forward-looking, not a picture of the present. And third, risk management. How do you manage that risks? And fourth, what are metrics? Have you given yourself uh, targets to decarbonize, to use alternative energy, and so on and so forth? And we have developed this for eight sectors, for banking, insurance, asset management, pension funds, energy, transportation, agriculture, and the industry sector. And so these are out there, and we are getting very positive feedback, because this would allow companies to provide better information what they do, and it would allow investors to differentiate. Thank you, Christian, very much. Um, Ambassador, in, in, in the morning, um, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, and then following that, Pavan, you know, said, markets are not there to deliver public goods, which I think is a debate we might have some other time. Um, but, but what was clear from both comments was that the role of governments in ensuring that markets deliver the kinds of public goods that are needed um, are absolutely critical. Not only regulators, not only voluntary action, those are important, but also governments that do policy. Governments that do policy. And I think the question we had from the far right uh, uh, no, yes, over there on the right is what I meant. Um, uh, I, I think was uh, kind of geared to that question of greed, of short-termism, of excessive profitability, of how do we make the financial sector right at a sort of cultural or ethical level, and, and is there any role for government to play in that at all? Um, I think it was you who said earlier today that uh, you were quoting somebody that... Um, Culture cannot be regulated. Um, but there are those who believe that culture can be, held, can be helped along into the right direction. Um, I don't truly believe that um, um, countries in Europe, um, now that they know the full consequences of inequality in the world, particularly in Africa and in the Middle East, uh, are indifferent to that inequality anymore. And they've become, uh, the, it's sort of become an existential reality for them. Although the reality of inequality is not in Europe, it's in Africa and it's in the Middle East. Um, some people might say that uh, the inequality was created because of greed, um, whether it's European greed or American greed or exploitative greed of poor countries. Um, I am of the opinion, though, that when people are given information and people understand the full externalities of their actions, of their investments, of their political choices, that they can be convinced, cajoled, incentivized to do things in a much more positive way. And I think this is where the United Nations comes in. Uh, it is really our role as, as a global institution to cross, to make the connections between the various peoples of this world and to show that decisions in one part of the world have real impact, even uh, with, 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 with consequences in another, and that those consequences might come back to haunt you if you do not manage those decisions that you're making that have impact elsewhere. And whether this is for climate, for economic issues, for poverty, for trade. Uh, this, is, th this is real now. I think everybody has become self-conscious about this. And I, this is my entree into this issue of inequality. Because yes, we have inequality in the world, and that inequality has risen exponentially, exponentially over the last 100 odd years, okay? Accelerated over the last uh, 30, 40 years, just acceler exploded. But we have begun to recognize that this is not sustainable. And it's become an existential threat to everybody, not just to those who are living poorly or those who are uh, living without. So I think if we can begin to get people to appreciate the full externalities of their choices 
And if we can mobilize the world around normative policy and regulatory actions that minimize these externalities, that pull out and take out the risk, that de-risk investment in long-term assets, uh, whether these are climate or, or food-related or water-related, that we are all better for it. And I think this has to be our challenge. Uh, and I don't believe, and, and here um, I, 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 I wonder whether, you know, it, what's happening in the United States, take as an example, isn't a classic example where once you get the, the full externalities of pulling back the health care bill, only became self-evidently clear to the regulators and to those who are supporting the pulling back of that once they recognized that it was affecting their own constituencies. And so the, the, the debate was not about inequality per se, but, but the reality was that once they understood that this was going to have a direct impact on the very constituencies that was keeping them in power and voting them into power, they were willing to pull back and allow this kind of positive outcome of a healthcare decision to remain in place. So you could use that inequality on education, on food, on water, on whatever other example you want to do, or on peace and security, uh, as has been the case in, in Europe. Okay, thank you. So we're coming to the end of the session. We have a few minutes, and uh, I've got that third question that both of you were keen for me not to ask, um, uh, which is, what does one do? What does one do? Uh, and, and obviously, I'm kind of keen to get beyond let's have a couple of more green bonds yes. or let's push forward a bit of disclosure, um, not because they're wrong, but because they're very small pieces of a much bigger puzzle. And I think folks here, of course, are interested in the specific, but also trying to understand just how ambitious can we be in reshaping finance to meet the needs of sustainable development and address climate challenges. And so I'd like to kind of push you, if I can, slightly beyond your comfort zone, just to sort of speculate on two or three things, um, even if you're not quite sure how to do them, that just are the right directions to take and potentially the right specific actions to make. And, and I would just frame this with actually two comments that you've made, Christian, and then I'll start with yourself. One is your, your comment in Dubai uh, at uh, another session that we participated in. You know, we don't want to green a broken system. We want to fix the system. That was one. And the second, actually, is a comment uh, from another context, uh, which follows on from this question of ethics and greed, uh, which was a group of bankers uh, in a closed meeting uh, that said to me when I asked what needs to happen next, they gave two answers. One was, well, we stopped stealing, and that's a good thing. I mean, this is a straight, this was a, this was a real conversation. Yeah, this was a set of leading bankers. And then they said, and we are irredeemably unable to change our culture as a set of global banks. Irredeemably unable to change our culture. So they said, you, you can regulate us, you can incentivize us, we can change our behavior, but if you want us culturally to change, you probably need a different set of institutions. And so I'm not asking you to agree with that. I'm just asking you to kind of rise to that level of ambition of asking what really are the big steps we need to take in pushing forward changes in financial markets so that they are fit for purpose for the 21st century. And Christian, if I may, I'm going to start with you. Thanks very much. I would say we're all interested in the long term. So that's not the problem. The problem is to overcome excessive short-termism. It's like a boat that tries to drift out to the ocean, but we're holding it back. And this is the issue. And I would ask with the ambassador, I would say, the UN can be much tougher. I don't think it's with appeals that we will just get there. I think you can be much stronger. We're all ethical on Sundays, so to say. The question is to be ethical throughout the, the week. And there are pockets in the financial system which I have not heard anybody saying that they have social value. The problem with finance is invisible, so it's very difficult. But we do know that of the stock market, 30 to 50% of turnover comes from high-frequency trading. This is computers, 
trading with computers. We, you, you know probably that stock exchanges are renting their basements so that the companies can be even closer to the stock exchange's computer to have the information which is today calculated not in milliseconds but in microseconds, which is one millionth of a second. This is 30 to 50 percent of our stock market turnover. I have not yet heard anybody ever who said that does give social value. So the question is, unless we stop issues where people can make in milliseconds or intraday gigantic profits and don't need to worry and be patient for the long term, we will not be able to move the financial system as a whole to the long term. So my plea would be, if you're interested in the long term, look at the short term and look what are the bad things, if I can say simply, that happening there. We had the excessive corporate reporting, we have the daily information, we are feeding ourselves saying today company X outperformed the index by 0.1% and so on, which are in a way meaningless statements because we know that corporate development does not happen from day to day, but from year to year. So that would be my big plea. Brilliant. Christian, absolutely fantastic. <laughs> they agree. They agree. Ambassador Kamal. Well, I can't beat that, but I can say this. Implementing that is a tall order. Uh, so if you look into the UN to deliver some regulatory system for the Dow Jones and other, yeah. uh, that uh, is not going to happen in my lifetime, I don't suspect. But there are others here who may think it might, and I'm, I'm willing to let them have a crack at it. What I will say, though, is this, um, and that's not to say I don't, I don't agree. I agree that those, those things do, do not have the social value uh, that, that is attributed to them. Uh, you know, it's, it's just greed. Um, having said that, I wonder how we can regulate them from the United Nations. Um, having said that, I just look at what's possible in the current frame of things. And the low-lying fruit that, are out, that is really out there that I think we as a collective global family can begin to act on. And there are certain things that are real destabilizers that make it very difficult for us to move on the positives that we need to move on. And these, and, I, and it's going to sound tired to you, but uh, it has to be said, these have to do with those things that create great disruptions in society. Inequality, poverty, uh, lack of access to health care, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And there's something that we can do about this now, rapidly, globally, in all countries. Uh, and it would make a huge difference to the world in which we live. And I think it would help us begin to, be, to think more rationally around the other issues, the bigger, more complex issues that we need to tackle. And I also think that, as a second thing, uh, science, technology, and innovation has a huge opportunity uh, that it avails us to leapfrog some of these problems that seem unsurmountable today, including in the very areas that I spoke of, fighting poverty, bringing health to all, uh, getting education to become a transformative uh, power in our societies. Uh, we can do this using the, the, the scientists and the, and the sciences uh, that are out there using the technology and the promise of technology. Uh, we are going to have a meeting at the United Nations convened uh, by the United Nations uh, in May, and we'll be focusing on this issue because we recognize that if there's been anything that has transformed the opportunities of human beings in the last 70 years, you and I were having a conversation about how human beings lived 150 years ago everywhere, not in Africa, not in everywhere, that 90% of all human beings were living in abject <coughs> poverty. And here we are 150 years later in a very, very different world. And the main drivers of that have been the markets, I'm sorry for those who don't believe in markets, have been science, have been technology, and have been innovation. So I, I personally believe that we have a huge opportunity if we can make the connections between what we are aspiring for in the SDGs and what is the promise of science, technology, and innovation in our world. 
ambassador, thank you. So uh, I'm being frowned at very heavily. Um, no, no, not at all. Give me two seconds and I'll just draw to a close. So firstly, thank you very much indeed. Uh, much appreciated. If, if I was drawing one thing out of the richness of uh, the conversation, uh, it's that the way we have in general framed our understanding of the financing challenge of the SDGs is to think about flows. How much money are we mobilizing for A, B, or C? I think what we hear from the two uh, to my left, but also from many other discussions, is that we have to understand finance as a system. And we have to understand that a little bit more green flow, leverage through a little bit more subsidy, may not be the smartest and may not be a possible pathway to a scale set of changes. I think both of you have illustrated in completely different ways that we need to reshape the way financial and capital markets work as an entire system. Uh, so for example, addressing the short in order to manage the long. The example, Christian, that you gave uh, a couple of minutes ago. And to understand where finance sits within a broader policy architecture rather than thinking of it as somehow sitting outside of the SDGs that we're seeking to progress. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, the panel